But I just want to make one or two comments uh, and then open it and let, want Richard to respond and then hopefully we can open it up to some discussion because we have some really good minds here. I, I just want to make a couple of points that, that kind of go across, and it's in somewhat it's unfortunate. We, have, we kind of broke up the sessions, and so we had human capital and, and labor supply early, and then we have capital taxation later. And, but a lot of the theme of the discussants, and, and Richard's talk and also some of the discussants were also emphasizing human capital. And human capital, of course, requires financing. Financing requires, uh, you know, inevitably that we gauge what's happening in terms of taxation and labor markets. And we know there are results where taxation can, if you really allow, you know, just take the proportional tax that Mike was talking about, has a substantial effect, uh, could have a substantial effect if you can really write off your taxes, uh, I mean your interest payments on your taxes to even encourage human capital. Although the, the result is not totally robust to general equilibrium conclusions. So I, I hope that maybe Alan can uh, move to this in the second uh, session. But there really is more of a disintegration. There should have been probably more. And I would ask the discussants exactly how you would think about integrating the, the human capital and the physical capital markets. I think it's a very important issue. College financing questions are really very topical now. Uh, the difficulty about uh, uh, individuals, a lot of discussion, political discussion, as well as economic analysis uh, of an analytical sort uh, looking at the effects of, uh, of, of different forms of, of credit market arrangements. And uh, uh, the question is really whether or not we have serious credit market restrictions. I mean, Mike Keene and Ken Wolpen wrote a very important paper published about 10, 12 years ago, suggesting that at least for the physical amounts of human capital acquired, that the, 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 the credit market constraint issue wasn't really all that important. And I think it would be interesting to talk about that. I, I personally don't think it's as important as many people have made it out to be, but nonetheless, it is a huge issue. So I would throw that out as a question that I think we really need to investigate. Secondly, I would talk about model of human capital. And Mike referred to an early paper of mine. Actually, it's part of my PhD thesis, so it's getting, getting up there in age. But, uh, uh, but really, it's important to understand that in the human capital literature, there are at least two different versions of human capital. And they have different implications for tax policy. And I'm a little bit worried that, that, the, that the version that Mike was talking about, and uh, I think it seems to be current now in the literature, is this version about learning by doing. And the idea is really that you work on the job, you acquire human capital, and that's kind of almost a free lunch. You get your earnings, and you simultaneously uh, get some additional human capital growth. But as many labor economists are worried about, I certainly worried about, I even have a paper where I simulate it and its effects in terms of the EITC, that if you imagine, and so the other model of, besides learning by doing is an on-the-job training model, and that's associated with Gary Becker and, and, and Jacob Mincer and Ben Porath and later work and so forth. And there the notion was that individuals were foregoing earnings and then buying investment on the job, and out of that getting human capital accumulation and the like. Uh, well, the interesting thing is, is that uh, these two different, these models have different implications for the tax profile. And the question is, what do we really know about the economics of human capital accumulation? I have this paper. I didn't bring any slides to, uh, to uh, promote it. I'm more than happy. To, it's published about a decade ago. We're looking at the EITC effects and looking at the differential effects of EITC on these two, with two different versions of the model of learning by doing versus on the job training. And they really were some substantially different effects. And we offered some evidence that actually tended to favor the uh, learning by doing model. But let me, having said that, uh, it, and therefore the analysis that Mike was talking about. So I, I, I certainly think that's an interesting uh, productive line of work. But it misses one important dimension. And this is a point that many economists, labor economists, have worked on more than, I don't know if it's recognized in public finance so much uh, uh, these days or ever was. But the, the other part is, is that Learning by doing, in general, involves people getting some learning content from the job. If you think of the firm as essentially supplying uh, different kind of training options, and there's a market for those options. Sherman Rosen wrote a paper about this some 40 years ago, and uh, this later paper that I talk about with myself and Lance Lochner and COSA. You get actually a convergence of these two models. They come actually very close to each other. And so the question is, is learning by doing really a free lunch? I mean, do you, if you buy in part, then what you're getting is foregone earnings. 
And then you can say, what's the tax treatment of foregone earnings? And that works in the opposite direction from what was being said. So there is an analytical question here, which is, I think it's very important. It does. I mean, in terms of... For, for, no, right. No, I thought you were disagreeing with the tax implications. Uh, no, but I mean, they have important implications. So it's not a trivial issue empirically. I mean, I have some very crude estimates with... Um, uh, with uh, and, I, and it's interesting to me. I mean, when I first started out in, in the profession, I was uh, deeply interested in this uh, learning by doing technology. And uh, it was very difficult, uh, I think, and I still think it's difficult to distinguish between these two models, especially if there's a market for jobs. And people are then, there's a foregone earnings component, and then the tax system comes in and actually to underwrite some of those costs. And then it goes the opposite direction. So the question is really, how important are these, uh, are these considerations? I think that's a potentially very important issue. And then, uh, so I could go on, but I don't want to go on because I really want to have, a, I want to be a, 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 at least a model for the chairs and the rest of the sessions. Uh, so I, I want to just ask la one last question. That has to do with entrepreneurial labor supply and occupational choice. That's kind of implicit in the human capital model. And I think Alan will talk a bit, a bit about this because capital income taxation, labor income taxation really kind of merge together with the self-employed and especially the entrepreneurs, the new startups and the like. And I think it's important to recognize that there does seem to be some real tax effect. I mean, Alan can correct us in terms of, of, of affecting who goes in and, and shapes various kinds of uh, structures of, uh, uh, you know, it, who decides to take a business risk and go in and so forth. And so this just reinforces the point I tried to make at the beginning of my comments, which is, you know, the separation of human capital and physical capital is quite artificial. And what we've done in the last, uh, so I even have a paper in the JPE years ago now, same year I was writing on both models, uh, 76 was a good year for me on human capital, I guess. But it, it, there was also a paper where I could show that in a partial equilibrium model, having proportional income tax actually promoted human capital accumulation. But that was basically through an interest rate reduction. And then later work was shown, well, if you embed it in a full general equilibrium model, the effects went away. So there, there's an open question. And I think we need to understand the mechanism a little better than we do. Finally, I would just speculate an answer on and ask and try to provoke Robert into this. He didn't really discuss it. But Richard showed very high marginal tax rates, especially for the working poor, uh, especially for the very poor. I mean, if you get rid of all the true marginal tax rates, including the loss of benefits, and what all the disincentives are for working. One can only help but think that is contributing in part to this question about fragmented families and, and so forth. Never mind the taxation of joint income. It's literally just simply saying, you know, uh, Wilson has this whole discussion about a lot of undesirable, uh, 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 and black men in particular uh, have become less desirable for many reasons to, to black women. The, mar the marriage rates are very, very high. And how much of that is actually contributed by this tax system? I would sort of raise that out. I mean, I realize there's no direct answer on that. But it does essentially make the, the incentive to gain any income very low. And that's one of the notions of what the gains from marriage might be, right, if we, if we had that. So I'd just be trying to provoke that. But what I would like is Richard to respond now, if you he, if he want. Uh, do you have a few responses? And then I hope we can have a few minutes to open it up, because there are a lot of issues we've raised here. And these issues are really important, and I just, I don't want to just, I, I think most of you, we could probably serve lunch in here during the discussion. Uh, I would prefer that we actually go with it, because, what's that? Quarter to, okay, fine. Okay, but I, I would like to just try to get, because I really want to open it up into, uh, into a discussion, because I, these issues are all great issues, and I, uh, I'm really grateful to the discussants and the presenter for making the points they have, and look forward to the rest of the discussion. So Richard, you want to take over? Great points. Um, a couple of things. One is migration, uh, Henry. I mean, I, if it was a UK audience, I'd make a little more of that because uh, it's clearly an issue, and uh, both at the top and at the bottom of the distribution. Um, and but I did also try and bring into the picture, you know, subsidies of childcare, elderly care. The picture of of what you include in the benefit welfare system includes many of those things that are complementary to work, and I think that's a key uh, key thing. Well, on Mike, um, I'm you know, very sympathetic to this. There is a discussion on this point about foregone earnings and the efficiency of taxes, um, which is a slightly different uh, way of looking at things, and it's much more sympathetic to the standard kind of way of thinking of taxes in human capital. But I'll, 
can come back to that. But my main uh, comment there was, uh, you know, one thing I think is clear that among, uh, among the low educated, this issue is much less important. You, you made that point. And so, but, but I think that there's a key point here, and that is the work that we've done on welfare reform, you've done indeed, you know, finds reasonably sized elasticities, not huge, but reasonably sized. Um, and, and that really, the human capital thing is the second order there in my view. And, uh, and that's where a lot of the emphasis of work on tax reform, very like Robert's case, you know, you look at the, you look at the low income groups and you think of reform that way. Actually, in some sense, that's what we did in Merleys. We thought, you know, we're allocating this amount of money to low income single parents. Let's think of a redesign of that, very similar to your, the way you thought of it. So I think it's not quite, you know, a critique of where we stand. You know, we certainly don't think that um, labor supply responses are zero among that group. We found quite the opposite, quite large responses for, for low education guys in responding to welfare programs at both extensive and intensive margin. Where we found smaller elasticities is among higher, higher educated group early on in their career, just as Mike pointed out. And I think we, um, we do need to reassess that. And I was trying to make that case. Um, the, uh, that on, um, yeah, uh, and, uh, and on, on Robert's point about age base, I, did I didn't mention the word age base several points. And the reason is, is that if you look at the way marginal taxes are structured and taxes in the tax system, they are age-based, actually. And, uh, and if you look at, for example, in the US, the way up until recently, and still including today with things like Medicare provision uh, and what have you, but especially around earnings tax, actuarial adjustment, they effectively are age-based taxes. And all we're really, what we did in our reforms was look at the, not the personal income tax, but the way the other taxes happen to operate at different times. Um, and point out that they're effectively age-based and they tend to be quite high at exactly the wrong places, often for reasons that are, you know, for other reasons, but nonetheless, when you look at the efficient design, you can think of, um, you can think of readjusting those programs in a way that appears age-related, but is in fact moving to much more uniform uh, structure of taxation across the life cycle often. You, you said that the rates are negative at very low incomes, and that picture from the Urban Institute suggests that. But then, of course, they whack up to about 80, 90 percent quite, at quite low incomes. And again, our reform structure was to, in fact, much more even that out. So it, it, although I think if you, in a sense, if I, I could put it another way, it's much more along your lines of, uh, of kind of looking at where the incentives are. They look pretty nuts. And by evening them out, you can get some pretty big gains and go in your direction. That, that's the way I would kind of respond to that uh, comment. But I think the best thing is to leave it open to uh, other responses. Okay. Your responses to the response? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we should open it up. And I'm very, I'd like to take questions and get, um, just get any reactions. There are a lot of open questions. Alan, okay. taxation, sorry, thanks, having to do with differential taxation and the pros and cons. The pros being if we identify elasticities that are different uh, or we can tag, we can have a more efficient tax system. The con being, um, Robert didn't use these words, but opening the door to rent seeking and, and other kinds of uh, political mischief that can uh, burn social resources and, and also generate the, not, the tax system quite different from the one that the economists had in mind. Um, but I, I think that I just wanted to point out a limitation to the, to the uh, notion that maybe a very simple tax system uh, with equal rates uh, has its advantages, at least in terms of uh, uh, avoiding opening Pandora's box, which is you still have to have a baseline. And an illustration I would use uh, relates to the, to the uh, discussion we had, we were hearing a year ago about whether Warren Buffett should uh, have a lower tax rate on his income than his secretary. Um, and what it really had to do with was the fact that we tax capital income differently from labor income. And of course, I'm gonna talk about that this afternoon, but one could argue that you should think of capital income and labor income quite differently. 
Um, and therefore, you might say for simplicity and to avoid rent seeking, we should have relatively uniform taxes on different kinds of labor income, but not necessarily on labor income versus capital income. But who's the arbiter of that decision of what goes in the box that gets subject to uniform taxation and what doesn't? That also is subject to the same kinds of political problems. So I, I think in, in principle, there, I mean, there's, these trade-offs certainly exist, but I'm not sure there's a simple answer in terms of how to come up with a tax system that's impervious to rent seeking uh, while at the same time bearing any relationship at all to what we think is a sensible tax system. Other comments? Gary. I found the uh, Richard's uh, presentation of his paper and all of the discussions, comments really very informative, showing us how complicated <laughs> this, ta this tax question is and how interdependent a lot of things are. Now, uh, there was some discussion by Michael of the uh, on-the-job training or the learning by doing whatever. I don't think there's as a sharp a distinction between these two approaches um, because in both of them, the nominal wage rate is not really the real wage rate and, and that's not really the effective cost of time. And I think that's common to both these approaches and that really, we've known for a long time, that can distort a lot of the effects of taxes and a lot of things on it. So I was happy to see that, that discussion. But it has I, a different implication, though, in terms of, uh, I mean, if it's a pure form of learning by doing with this free lunch aspect, it does have different implications. Yeah, but I, I don't think one, one wants to interpret learning by doing as free lunch in a, in a well, market. Well, but I think it is, though, in your, in your paper. Well, right? well, it shouldn't be. No, I mean, <laughs> you were, I didn't see it in your paper where's the, where there's the market for jobs or where there's a heterogeneity yeah, yeah. in learning across the different sites. I mean, that... That I think you but get the, the some, price is the leisure you get. Yeah, on. I can't. No, that that's uniform though. Each job that I get, <laughs> yeah. wherever I work, I get an extra Who unit. Who has a floor now? I thought I had a floor. <laughs> well, no, no, no. But actually, no. The only reason is is that it's as going, chair, I will be I, dictator it, here it for should, one second, only because I think analytically there's an important yeah, distinction. Yeah. I think I think it really is yeah, important. But it should really, not be a free lunch. I don't know. I, I don't. No, but I think in the models it is a free lunch. Yeah. It is. You work today, you get, you get the wage payment, and then you get that learning, which yeah. is on every job. Let me you leave. have to Let's give up leisure. To... Yeah. Leisure is the only opportunity cost. That's yeah. the part that bounds it. Yeah. But there isn't any notion that I have to shop around and get a better job or a worse job. I think that's the important yeah. part. No, I agree with you on yeah. that. So let me go so, on a couple anyway. of other points. Uh, um, <laughs> I didn't see much discussion, and maybe it, it's a small margin, the effect on years of schooling or some measure of education, quality of education and so on, um, in Richard's presentation. I don't know if Richard, you do, you see yeah, here? Yeah, I don't know if you do a lot with it, but I didn't, I, I didn't hear much, much discussion of that. Just one final point. I mean, once you, once you delve into the variety of effects that emanate from any policy, it gets more and more complicated, and that, that's what I find challenging in the tax area. Take, for example, child care subsidies. Well, on first blush, those are compliments to work. You have child care, women goes, goes to work, and, uh, and, and she doesn't have to take care of her kids. What does it do to fertility? Does it affect fertility rates? If it affects fertility rates, brings women out of the labor force, at least to some extent while they're pregnant, maybe in, in additional times, does it affect marital formation? So each time I explore any, any one of these effects, I say, well, you know, yes, I, I know you have to have simple models. Nobody has accused me of having too complicated models. I mean, and you need simple models, but uh, you have to be careful that where you're going to, you know, where you're going to put closure on this. And I think on childcare, I'd be careful about whether I'm going to say, yeah, in the short run, that's going to have an effect, whether it has in the long run. I think uh, it's going to, certainly going to be attenuated, and it could even be reversed by the effects on things like fertility and um, single parenthood and the like. Oh, yes, Jim. Jim Paterba. I, I was just going to pick up on the discussion of human capital for a second, because I think it will surprise many of the labor economists in the room uh, that the canonical model that public finance economists have used to think about optimal income taxation, the, the, the 1971 Murley's model, 
is one with, uh, it's, a, it's a one period model and it's one where the distribution of abilities is given right. and it's not, it's not endogenous, right? It's not something where there's the possibility of making these investments in human capital which can, which can lead to changes in that distribution. And I think a very welcome development uh, is that we are now just beginning to see a greater attention within the public finance community to the endogeneity of that ability distribution and the, the way human capital can evolve. And, you know, there, there are at least two different dimensions to think about in this. One is the, the sort of, you know, the, the, the mean effect uh, which is just the, the rate of return that one earns to an investment in human capital or on the job training. And that's the place where the direct interaction with the, the, the taxation of capital income comes into play because you're thinking of it as an alternative to investing in stocks or bonds or whatever. Uh, and the progressivity of the tax schedule, of course, can matter since you're, if you're giving up uh, wage earnings early in the lifetime for higher earnings later on, the relative rates that apply in those two, in those two scenarios can be, can be very important. And I think that's where a lot of, the, to the extent there has been attention to this before, the theory has, has, has focused on that. Uh, we really haven't got a lot of empirical evidence, I don't think, that bears on the nature of these supply elasticities on this margin. I think the other element, though, that, that, that is emerging as, as the, the, the theoretical literature on, on income taxation and, and taxation of the life cycle has moved forward is, is thinking about the insurance consequences of human capital investments. Now, Richard pointed to the, the, the shifting of the level of the distribution and the nature of the, of the life cycle uh, wage distribution for those with different levels of schooling, uh, but understanding how human capital may affect the riskiness of your wage profile over the lifetime, uh, and also understanding whether human capital investments, which might, for example, be subsidized by government programs or by the tax system, uh, are complementary or substitutable for the innate level of ability that people start with. Uh, and uh, depending on the nature of that complementarity uh, or the nature of that cross-elasticity, and this is some work that uh, an MIT PhD student, Stephanie Stanchiva, has been, been working on, you, know, you can end up in situations where uh, if the social welfare function is pushing you toward a more egalitarian outcome, and human capital is very complementary to the earnings of low ability folks, then it becomes an extremely attractive policy because it raises the bottom end. Uh, on the other hand, in situations where the complementarity is toward those at the top end of the ability distribution, uh, you'll actually tighten the, you know, the, the sort of redistributive constraint, and that makes, it makes these policies somewhat less attractive ex ante. So I think there's an enormous amount of work to be done by the public finance community taking on board some of the lessons where you know, the labor economists would regard this as things that have been thought about for many decades, but, uh, but I think it's just beginning to filter into the public finance part here. Yes, Gene Sterling. Okay. Oh. I'm wondering if some of our, our speakers uh, might comment on how we interpret data over time. Because at the end of the day, I think, you know, I was one of these people that also looked at all the cross-sectional evidence and they tended to, tended to show, low, I don't care what it was, low elasticities, no matter, no, matter, no matter where you were, the debate was always whether the elasticity of one thing or the other was zero or 0.4. I always seem to come up in the literature. But, but then we look at certain things over time. They have to have an effect. An example for me is uh, no one really saves, or 80% of the population doesn't save that much for, for retirement. And yet people are retiring today about 11 years, particular life expectancy, more than they did in 1940. So something's going on. And there must be a response. Now, this may be a response. These may be income effects. They may be wealth effects. They may be substitution effects. And we don't find them in, in, you know, in the literature, which tended to say, well, Social Security is not having that much of an effect at least initially on, 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 on some of these activities. So without getting into that specific example, you know, how do we tease out a time series where we all have the classic issue, more, you know, more explanations than there are observations, so on and so forth. How do we tease out things that might happen over time, pure effects that I think actually drive a lot of stuff in the welfare area? Our pure effects might even drive retirement. You know, some, my neighbor goes to Florida, so I'm gonna go to Florida. Even though when we look across tax rates, it looks like we we don't have any difference in behavior. And Richard only gave one example, which was the cross-country uh, comparison. It might be one way to get at that. But I'm just curious how, how each of you think about how you try to tease what we tend to think are large effects over time, and yet contradicting some of the uh, empirical evidence we do, we just do some of our, our simple regressions. Richard, you, you talked about reference dependence uh, I, I did. And in your talk and in other discussions. So. Yeah. I think, I mean, uh, the, uh, on Social Security incentives, uh, I mean, it's a huge research area. I mean, one point to make there is as uh, the earnings tests have been uh, dis you know, removed and actual fairness comes along uh, and other kind of restrictions that are kind of just bound where labor supply can be, elasticities get bigger. 
you know, that's, I think, a number of people point. There's a nice paper by French and Jones, for example, that shows that. And I think we're seeing that. I've been doing some work in the UK where elasticities now look a little bigger because there is, there's kind of room for response. You know, when, when, when there's a, a, a huge cliff through an earnings test or something, that, you know, when that gets relaxed, then, uh, then people move. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, the, yeah, that's right. But on top, but it's still the case. You're right that even recently, you know, just to take the last five years in the UK and the US. That's you know, all the employment growth has been among the old older people, in particular among uh, older women. That's pretty important. There's a lot of you know high education older women who could be supplying a huge amount more of. Uh, of, of uh, you know productive labor supply coming through in cohorts they're responding to something very strongly but a lot of that is just the the, the point at which um, you know which the which the uh, for example social security retirement age happens to be but with actual, you know with actual fairness the incentives are very small it's just more like a, a norm and if you look the French and Jones paper makes a good point that if you look at other other parts of the system like Medicare, they make the point that there still is a disincentive there that moves with, the, with, with that age. And so there's a little more going on than, say, David Blau has managed to find. But that's a, that's a big deal, that we still can't explain all those movements. That's just a response. I mean, that really is a, is, a, is a panel data kind of model where you're using differential incentives across people in different cohorts coming through to retirement to try and pin down effects. So it's definitely not a cross-section, but whether it's really getting these long-term effects, including you know, how you pick out the long-term human capital effects, they're, they're much harder to uh, dig out. But, yeah, but, but I think we're finding much bigger responses now as, as, as you know, incentives have now become such that people can, can respond. Uh, it's kind of obvious. Any, yeah, Henry. Uh, just, uh, just wanted to make a very simple point going back to the learning by doing versus on the job. Uh, training discussion. So, so one thing that has a really big implication for uh, how we want to tax is if, um, if earnings tomorrow somehow depends on the earnings choice today. Right. And there are a number of ways in which that can happen. And I just sort of just wanted to make the point, learning by doing and, and on the job training are not the only channels. Sure. We also have job market signaling, we have search effects and so on. So uh, I don't know exactly where the, the, the labor literature sort of stands in terms of the relative importance of those effects, but I just there's sort of just what's going to have big impacts certainly is just if earnings choices or labor supply choices today. But search can be impact. put in a framework like, you know, basically opportunity costs foregone. That, that can be pretty easily right. adjusted into the kind of on-the-job training framework, I think. And even yeah. tax policy implications, I think, are similar to the standard OJT. Uh, yeah. yeah. In some sense, what search. I'm saying is, yeah. That, yeah, so one approach would be a reduced form approach that sort of take sort of optimal succession where you just sort of model that earnings tomorrow depends on earnings choices today and we sort of try and right. get that total effect and that could be quite large maybe when we sort of add up all the Yeah, but earnings choices would be net of what the deductions would be and sort of how sure. I can use the tax system to either pay for or not pay for the investments that I take. And that's, so it's kind, of, it's kind of an obvious point to a public finance economist, but it actually plays a pretty key role in the answer to your question, I think. Right, but interesting. Other, Mike? You well, just, just one comment. On the stuff by French, for example, when, when people look at uh, labor supply responses of older men, they, they they tend to find large elasticities, and and that's perfectly consistent with the argument I was making earlier, because for the, the older men have essentially, uh, I mean, largely stopped investing. So, so for them, the wage really is the price of time, roughly equal to the price of time. And so this econometric bias I was talking about uh, isn't there. Right? So, so you would expect to get sort of reasonably correct elasticity estimates just by looking at responses to wages, uh, observed wages for older men, and, and, uh, and you do get large responses. So I, so I take that as consistent with, uh, and also you see small responses for young people for the opposite reason. So. Okay, any other <laughs> questions? Yes, one more set of comments. So uh, 
I wanted to comment on the, uh, on the, uh, on the focus on the labor supply elasticities versus uh, taxable income, which you know, in, in the public literature there, there has been definitely a big shift toward uh, thinking about uh, taxable income elasticities as sort of you know, the key, uh, uh, key measure of, uh, of behavioral responses. And you're right that, uh, uh, that much of what we think is going on there is uh, is about uh, tax avoidance and uh, related things. It's not that those are not costly, so uh, you know, that they're important. But uh, but one of the original reasons for uh, for thinking about uh, taxable elasticities is that uh, it's actually picking up uh, other margins of labor supply uh, related responses that uh, that you just don't see in participation or you don't see in uh, in, in hours. So effort would be one. Uh, that's you, know, you see that in earnings, you don't uh, necessarily see it in uh, easily in uh, in hours of work. And another one, which sort of ties to a lot of uh, what has been discussed, uh, is uh, occupational choice, which right. I don't think we really have uh, a lot of evidence on. But uh, and it's it's very difficult to measure. Uh, you know, the, the types of approaches that we use are sort of short-term approaches, and occupational choice is presumably a much much more uh, you know, longer-term. Uh, uh, a longer term decision, but uh, uh, it is a potential, uh, an extremely important uh, margin of response that uh, sort of operates in you know, middle. Uh, you could, like your graphs were, were showing that there isn't really that much going on for people in middle ages, uh, but uh, that's not necessarily true once you start uh, thinking about uh, about that margin of response. And uh, you, know, you can sort of think about, I don't know, uh, international evidence on, uh, on on things like this. You know, Scandinavian countries. Uh, uh, if you think about uh, who the teachers are in Scandinavian countries and what the same women are doing in uh, in the in the United States, and they are probably pursuing very different occupations. That has important implications. Yeah, I completely agree, and it almost comes back to the education and career choice <laughs> point. The problem is the identification estimation strategies in this work is very short term and it's clearly not picking up human capital occupation effects. I think it's exactly right to think of them, uh, but that's not the way it's done. It's not picking that up. It's almost surely picking up these other things more lightly, picking up these other things, which are important, but I don't think it's really capturing yet, um, or we haven't thought of using that strategy yet in capturing that. I think of it more as the going right back to education choices and uh, and there, you know, the evidence, I, I, we do have some evidence we're getting by studying cult, new entry cults in the US and the UK, but there's incredible little work on this, looking at the, I mean, Jim has some work, by the way, on what people perceive as their earnings, how taxes affect that, and how as Jim Viterbo mentioned, you know, the insurance value. We're finding the insurance value to be pretty important, actually, yes. which is uh, a kind of, you know, it's an interesting point. Uh, it hasn't really been looked at in the literature so much. Let me, let me just respond, raise a question and just throw it out for the rest of the day. There is a lot of work in labor economics and versions of labor economics estimating things like occupational choice and educational choice, but the methodology that's been used is primarily what's called structural econometrics and so forth. And my impression is, looking at the public finance literature, that's kind of fallen out of favor, more or less. And so the kind of, so if you look at like Cameron and Tabor's results, they really are showing strong effects, you know, of wages and uh, tuition costs and so forth on choices of who goes to college. And, and the same thing is true in occupational choices when that's been modeled, choices of who goes to education. And I'm just curious of whether or not that's a permanent feature of the public financial literature. It just seems like a natural, a natural symbiosis here is to say, well, okay, a lot of robust methods. And it's not like saying there's one method that's superior, but in some sense, these long-run questions are going to require some notion. And even, and Alan is, of course, an expert on this computation of general equilibrium and uh, really understanding kind of what the long-term consequences, because we've seen a lot of studies, and short-run effects are very substantial if you look at the micro estimates. But then when you actually simulate what the effects are in the economy, like we have this old paper with uh, Lochner and Tabor, uh, where we looked at the effect of a tuition subsidy. It had a very substantial effect on who went to college. But the trouble is a lot of people went to college. The price of college labor goes down, and, the le and, and Alan has a lot of calculations like that. So I'm just curious, as a methodological question, it doesn't have to be settled today or at least this minute, 
but just exactly how the public finance literature proceeds in, in looking at Auerbach and Kotlikoff, for example, and some of the journal equilibrium work. Because a long run journal equilibrium consequences, I think, are real, or is it just a view that these things are so hopelessly hard and no, and maybe computationally meaningless and, and on and on and on that it can't be done? I, I, I'm just, it's a question, not a remark. I'm just curious about the state of the literature. So. I put up a slide on that. Yes. Very, very, uh, well, you've worked on that, Worried of about it. Yeah. Um, I mean, clearly the divide in approach is just hindering the whole field. Um, and it seems that some of the questions, you just have to bring a, a more structural approach to bear. And I guess the key, what, what I think the key, you know, development has been is just been trying to mix, you know, use, uh, use some of the kind of quasi-experimental ideas in just... Uh, validating those models. Uh, sometimes it's pretty hard to do. I mean, I, I think if you take a human capital model or education choice model, it's pretty hard to come up with, uh, you know, identification strategies that aren't um, fairly, uh, fairly strongly based on uh, economic assumptions that are hard to, pretty hard to test. But, but, but there is otherwise we can't make uh, much But on this human capital literature, what we're actually yeah. seeing is in much better data coming yeah, available yeah, yeah. about the nature of the training, yeah. like the work in the yeah. German training programs. Yeah. And so I think that's the answer. We're going to get more yeah. detailed we, studies of the firm. Much more and, detailed and, data sets. You can follow new entry codes and see how. Exactly. So in other words, just, instead of just fitting a wage, a wage equation by itself, it's going to be pretty, pretty ambiguous, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> like you were saying. Yeah. But uh, No, it's an exciting agenda, but it's... It is. It's yeah. exciting. And it's, it's emerging. She's saying zero. You want to go to lunch? Is that it? Or? <laughs> so are there any other questions? We, we still have the rest of the day. Although I don't have the podium anymore, so I feel like I, <laughs> <laughs> so I feel I have to use my monopoly powers. It's shrunk to zero. So, okay. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank the speakers and the discussants for a very interesting session. <laughs>